Beloved, please open your Bibles to Isaiah 55 for a sermon expounding the passage there starting with verse 6 through the end of the chapter, a message entitled, A Call to Repentance. It was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones who said, Christianity starts with repentance. I think he meant that until and unless you have repented, you are no Christian, that impenitent ones are lost without Christ. My most important living mentor, Albert N. Martin, said repentance is the soul's divorce from sin. It's worth calling that to mind. We divorce sin only to marry Christ and be saved. Here then, this divinely inspired call to repentance in Isaiah 55, starting with verse 6. And this is the word of the Lord. When the reading is finished, I invite the believing congregation to respond with a hearty amen to God's word. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Amen? Amen. 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 God's word. It may be helpful for us to boil the message of these verses down to a simple statement as a summary. And I would offer one to you now that I've composed to the best of my ability. I think the passage is teaching us to repent now and despite what you think, you will be immensely blessed because God says so. I'd say that covers the basis of these verses. Repent now, and despite what you think, you will be immensely blessed because God says so. Beloved, our topic for the whole sermon is really repentance and the call to repentance in this passage. Before we digress to the uh, traits of this call to repentance, Uh, We need to be on the same page concerning what this repentance is. And uh, we can use the term repentance or repent in various senses, but the one I intend tonight is what has been called in in our glorious tradition of sound teaching, repentance unto life. Repentance unto life. That's the topic of Isaiah 55. That repentance which is associated with an an experiencing of the saving mercies of God on the other side of repentance. 
the forgiveness of sins, and the entrance to fellowship with God. Um, this is the repentance associated with being saved. You see, as unpopular as this doctrine is, I'll state it boldly anyway because Scripture teaches it, and as God is my witness, I have to give an account for my preaching on Judgment Day as one who was called to be faithful to the message of this book. Until we repent, beloved, we are nothing but lost sinners. No matter how impressive we might be to others who know us, if we are moral people or nice people or spiritual people, until we repent, we are without God, we are not yet pardoned, uh, promised to the repenters in this passage. Verse seven, let him return to our God because returning our God will abundantly pardon. We are spiritually dead. Before and until repentance, we are hurtling toward eternal judgment and the lake of fire as punishment for our unforgiven sins. We are but sinners. And in the biblical usage of the term, sinners doesn't just mean someone who's this short of perfect. A sinner is a, is a bad person, an immoral, evil, wicked person. That's the way such are described in this passage, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. These are adjectives that are fairly applied to us until repentance unto life. Some are more obviously wicked than others if they're not Christians. But in the sight of God, he knows the heart is desperately wicked. Who can comprehend the depth of the unconverted person's moral depravity and spiritual perversity? None of us. And you know, the, the irony is the most wicked people deny that they're wicked. It's called self-righteousness. Jesus had the most severe censures for these people, not the obviously immoral like tax collectors and harlots. They were the despised sinners in Jesus' day. And Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees who considered themselves righteous that these tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you do. Read Matthew 23 and its sevenfold denunciation of the self-righteous Pharisees to see Jesus teaching on the matter. So repentance is an act for sinners, the wicked, and, and repentance unto life involves laying hold positively on God's mercy in Christ by faith. There's a, there's a laying hold of his saving mercy coupled with a genuine grief and hatred of sin. In repentance unto life, a soul turns from sin to God to worship God instead of our idols to serve the Lord obediently instead of living in defiance of his revealed will. The, the repentance unto life of which I speak and of which this chapter speaks is a repentance that uh, encompasses or entails intending and striving to obey God from the heart from then on. And, and there's so many passages of scripture that confirm this doctrine of repentance and, um, in both the Old and the New Testaments. But one that is important we should notice well is Galatians 5.24. 
Uh, there, the Apostle Paul wrote, those who belong to Christ Jesus, and this is the same thing as saying those who are true Christians, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, past tense, the flesh, this isn't referring to the physical body, it's a term for our sinfulness. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And in the context, this means sinful passions and sinful desires. This is the definitive repentance unto life associated with a true conversion to the Lord, such as Isaiah envisions here in this passage. Now, God calls us to repent in Isaiah 55. And I see in these eight verses four points to be made about this call to repentance with two verses for each of the four. In the first two verses, we see it's an urgent call. In the next two, it's an amazing call. In the next two verses, it's an effective call. And in the last two, we see it is a blessed call. And I, I pray, and I have been praying, that God will grant repentance to us by means of our preaching today and your hearing. Well, look with me then at the basis for my saying that the call to repentance here is an urgent call to repentance in verses six and seven. And the urgency of the call is implied in two phrases. It says in verse six, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And, and the, the expressions convey the truth that uh, now, when you hear the call to repent, the Lord may be found. Now, as you're being confronted with his heavenly call to repent, the Lord God is near in some sense that he, he won't be to you forever if you don't repent. This is a limited time opportunity. This is something you ought to attend to immediately. You know, it is said that you have about two minutes to get out of a house once it catches on fire, if you're gonna make it out alive. Maybe a little more, but not much. You have t your house catches on fire, get out immediately, because if you don't, you may not make it out. After about two minutes, you're likely to face heat of 600 degrees, choking smoke, and noxious fumes that are created by the burning of the house. And of course, you know, I'm sure that so many people who die in a fire aren't killed by the burning, they're killed by smoke inhalation. Well, listen, my friends. As a delay in escaping a burning house is likely a deadly mistake. So not repenting immediately is even more dangerous. One may die physically in a house fire and find themselves in the favor and immediate presence of the Lord Jesus Christ but not if one refuses to repent. You know, the, the, the prophet's statement, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near, implies that sinners tend to be very presumptuous. That even if they will consider the prospect of repenting, it's typically put off for later. There is a procrastination and a tendency to do so. When, when Augustine, the church father, was beginning to, to consider the Christian faith as his very own, he, he knew he was living an immoral life as a young man, and one of his life-dominating sins was sexual sin. 
And there's a famous passage in Confessions where he admits to God that he, he prayed for chastity as an unconverted man. But do you know how he prayed for it? Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. But not yet. That's like saying, Lord, get me out of this burning house in 10 minutes. It's extremely dangerous. It's not in the Bible, but it's, it's an axiom that we all know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And people usually say that in a figurative way, but literally the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That is, multitudes of multitudes of those who are even now, beloved, in hell, intended someday to repent and never got to it. This is why Scripture says, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the years come when you are elderly. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus warned about this kind of spiritual procrastination in a parable he told that had a, a wicked servant of a master. And when the master was away, the servant thought to himself, to quote the Lord Jesus precisely, this is Matthew 12, 48, if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and if that evil servant then, because he thinks the master is delayed in returning, shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunk, the drunks, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he doesn't look for him in an hour that he's not aware of and shall cut him asunder. The old King James means cut him into pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And why this miserable end for the wicked servant? Well, not only because he was wicked, but because he thought he had more time to get his act together and to behave like a faithful servant instead of a wicked servant, but he procrastinated his repentance. Don't you be like that. Wisdom calls you, and if you refuse the call of wisdom, the day will come when wisdom will not only disown you, but mock you for your stupidity. You remember wisdom's call in Proverbs 1, starting with verse 24. This is wisdom personified speaking to the simple one and envisioning, envisioning the simple one procrastinating in coming to, to, to wisdom. Wisdom says, because I have called and you refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded, but you have set it not all my counsel and you wanted none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes, when your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early then, but they shall not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They wanted none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. This is disturbing. People want to believe that God will be eternally merciful toward the unrighteous. 
He tells us in advance he will not be. When people just like you, if you're not a Christian here today, heard preachers just like me calling you to repent as God's instruments, and you said, well, not yet. And then you die in that impenitent state. This poetic passage portrays wisdom who was calling you as now ridiculing you. Ha, 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 ha. You thought you were so smart not to listen to me, but look at you now. I bet you regret your procrastination now, don't you? And you're getting what you deserve for turning a deaf ear to me. This is the the imagery of Proverbs chapter 1. It's horrifying. You need to know that God's wrath is already kindled against you if you're not a true believer. The, The Psalm 7 says... God is angry with the wicked every day. And and, and this is the God who at the same time is mercifully calling you to, to, to pardon from him for free. And hearing the call, it's 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 like you're in the burning house and the Lord standing outside and saying, Come out of there into the into the safety and the fresh air. You need to be like Lot in Sodom called by the angels to escape for your life. And you escape by repentance. Before you repent, you're far from God. You're not calling upon him, the text says which indicates true prayer and worship. But when you are repenting, that involves seeking the Lord, verse 6 says, calling upon him as one needing mercy, returning to him from your unbelief and hostility toward him to a new relation of faith and love toward God who calls you. Before you repent, your relation to sin is that you tolerate the status quo of a sinner's way and thoughts. Look at verse 7. You see, a wicked man has his way, which of course is a wicked way. From a wicked man comes a wicked way. And an unrighteous man entertains impenitently, impenitently his unrighteous thoughts. So so before repentance, what does that mean for us? It means that we tolerate and and accept our wicked ways and our unrighteous thoughts and we keep them up day after day after day. We maintain the spiritual status quo and this is is really just the impiety and immorality which is commonplace among non-Christians in the world. Do you want to know? what wicked ways and unrighteous thoughts are like? Um, First of all, examine your own heart and life apart from Christ, but think about all the unbelievers you know and uh, wicked ways and unrighteous thoughts manifest in as many ways as the people you know. For some people it's absolutely disgusting the way they act and the things they say. And you know they're filthy and vile. For other non-Christians, it doesn't seem bad, really. They're good people, it seems, and they are healthy and prosperous and have nice families and volunteer at the soup kitchen, and yet they have no love for Christ, and they Maybe they don't go to church, or maybe they do, and they're just going through the motions. But all of it is unacceptable to God. All of our righteousnesses, so-called, are as filthy rags in his sight, Isaiah 64 says. But when you repent, this involves, to use the language of verse 7, 
forsaking your naturally sinful way and your naturally unrighteous thoughts. To quote the Baptist Catechism number 92, this kind of repentance entails full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. This, and nothing less, is true repentance. Repentance unto life. Not just mental assent to the things you hear preached out of the Bible. Not mere sorrow for sin, but a real and spiritual, moral turnabout of your heart and life. Now, now for me to preach this, I know I... I'm going against the grain of what is commonly preached and taught in many evangelical churches. Listen, brethren, I have a long history of church attendance and familiarity with Christianity, especially in America. And I can tell you, whether you know this or not, it's true that there are many pastors and theology books and radio broadcasts and TV broadcasts that would say, oh, well, when the, if they even talk about repentance, some of them will say, well, that just means you change your mind about accepting Jesus as your personal Savior, and as far as repenting from sin, that's maybe something you get around to as a born-again Christian. Heresy, brethren. The, the impenitent ones remain unforgiven. Didn't you know this is the plain teaching of the Bible? For example, I, I could heap verses upon verses to prove this, but a couple of striking passages are in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 9, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he, he says to them, Know ye not, King James translation, know ye not. In other words, don't you know? Don't you know this? And then he states something that they, sh they either knew or should have known. Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That is, the unrighteous man who will not forsake his thoughts and his wicked ways. Do not be deceived, Paul wrote, neither fornicators. Now here he gives a vice list of different kinds of sins that are more obvious in this person's life and maybe another one in another person's life. Those who practice sexual sin are called fornicators. Those who worship idols are called idolaters. Those who are unfaithful to their spouses are called adulterers. And uh, in the King James, effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. These phrases, um, I've studied them carefully, they refer to various perverted sexual practices nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And watch it, verse 11, and such were some of you, you Christians in the church. These very sins are sins you used to be held in bondage to, to committing as a practice of your life. Not anymore. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He could say that to all the Christians because repentance unto life is associated with a true conversion. We, 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 there, it doesn't make any sense to talk about a Christian thief or a Christian adulterer. If you're a thief or an adulterer, you're no Christian. And then, then, you know, don't miss Ephesians 5, which is shorter and, if anything, even more direct. Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6. 
For this you know, that no, and the King James word is whoremonger. Doesn't that sound vile? And it is. No whoremonger. No unclean person. No covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, what things? Well, the things he just mentioned, the sins he just mentioned. Because of impenitence in these sins, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. That's an idiom that means people whose lives are fundamentally characterized by disobedience to God. It's a biblical idiom, the children of something. It means those who are that way, deep down in their souls. They're impenitent ones, they're disobedient ones. And, you know, the Lord has just brought to my memory another verse that's very short. And I hope I can find it on the spot like this. But it is found in 1 John. And it's chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to this. 1 John 3, 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You know, you know what the ungodly desire is? To have your sin and not be punished for it as well. The ungodly person wants to practice murder, hatred, adultery, fornication, lying, cheating, stealing, indulge all their sinful lusts and have no consequences. Brethren, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter six, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. You know, you know what people do? They sow their wild oats and then pray for crop failure. That's not how it works. Paul wrote further, whoever sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap life eternal. Multitudes of preachers today insist otherwise in the name of grace. God have mercy. Well, look, there's not only an urgent call to repentance here, but there's a promise to the repenters in verse 7, which says, let the wicked, unrighteous person forsake his way and return to the Lord, and what will happen? What does verse 7 say will be the consequence? He, that is the Lord, will what? Are you paying attention? He will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Mercy basically is the withholding of deserved punishment and pardon is forgiveness. Righteous man, the wicked person turns from his immoral, impious thoughts and ways, even though he deserves to be punished for them, the Lord will not punish him, in other words. The Lord will forgive him his sins. The Lord will not just forgive him, but it says abundantly pardon him. It may be translated from the Hebrew, he will cause to be great slash much pardon. One translation says he is rich in forgiveness. The, the, the forgiveness that God gives to the repenting sinner is a forgiveness that is 
purely gracious, it's a free gift. It's absolutely comprehensive, forgiveness for all of our sins. It's a forgiveness that is irrevocable and eternal. Don't you know it's, a, it's really provable from Scripture that those whom God forgives anything, He will forgive everything. This forgiveness is not only withholding the punishment due to us legally for our sins, but it also entails the gift of a perfect justifying righteousness, which we lack, a righteousness that is only found outside of ourselves in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ with his righteousness and the reward of his righteousness, which is eternal life, is given to the repenting sinner freely. In other words, the repenting sinner is justified. And the old Baptist catechism from uh, Bygone days, question 36, defines justification this way. This is beautiful. Listen. Justification, by the way, the year is 1693. Benjamin Keach, I think, was involved in composing it. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Amen. These are, these are the easiest of terms for the blessing. You, you and I, by our sins, have offended God Most High. And though we deserve legal punishment, the God who is just is also merciful and loving. And he says, turn, and I will forgive it all. Turn from your sins back to me, and I will abundantly pardon you. And I'm telling you, do it now, and do it daily. The whole Christian life is a practice of repentance from our sins, is it not? Now, that's the urgent call in verses 6 and 7, but notice, secondly, it's an amazing call. An amazing call, verses 8 and 9. And these verses have been, I think they're pretty well-known verses, but I'm not sure they are really understood as they should be in the context by many people. Because those verses say this, and of course, this is God speaking, God the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, and now through me to us. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, first of all, it, it is true that this is a glorious text affirming the absolute transcendence of God above all his creatures. But in the context of Isaiah 55, I think it has a peculiar connotation, and it's this. The mercy and pardon that has just been promised to the repenting sinner is hard to believe for us. It's an incredible almost unbelievable blessing that comes to the repenting ones. And part of our problem in being repentant and forgiven is it seems too good to be true. Really? Really? If we know much of God and much of ourselves, how, how holy God is and how depraved by nature we are, this like Instant forgiveness, it, it sounds like a pipe dream. You mean I don't have to suffer and atone for my own sins either in this life or in purgatory? That's exactly right. If, if Adolf Hitler had repented in the last minute of his earthly life, 
instant forgiveness of all his crimes. Do you believe that? Well, of course, of course, that's the kind of thing this passage promises. But we, you see, we struggle with unbelief regarding God's grace. That unbelief is a stumbling block in us to be cleared away. And these verses 8 and 9 help us to overcome in the grace of God our skepticism because God says his thoughts and ways are not our thoughts and ways. And there's, a, there's an allusion to the previous passage where we read about the wicked way and the unrighteous man's thoughts and then those words, way and thoughts, are repeated in verse 8. My thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, and my ways not your ways. In other words, we, being wicked, are unjust, but God is most just. We are stingy, but God is most generous. We are unmerciful by nature, but God is most merciful. And you know, the thing about repentance unto life is not only is it turning from sin, it's also an embracing of the truth about God and his wonderful mercy. Look, there's a similar passage in Psalm 103 that I believe does justify my interpretation of verses 8 and 9 in Isaiah 55. You can look at the passage with me if you would. Psalm 103, starting with verse 8. You'll see the similarity and the connection with mercy. Listen to this. Psalm 103, 8 to 12. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, amen. Here we have this language about the heavens being high above the earth and expressly compared to the greatness of God's mercy toward those who fear him, that is those who are repenting and trusting in the mercy of the Lord. What can we say about the love and mercy and pardoning of God Almighty to repenting sinners. This, this poem has a very interesting pedigree and heritage, but I'm sure you've, some of you at least have heard the words before. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known to men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Look, the call to repent is an amazing call because it promises the saving mercy of God to those who repent. And if you realize anything of how bad our sins are and how great that mercy is, it seems impossible. It seems impossible that God should give us this eternal life on the terms of our repenting, but he does. Thirdly, I want you to see this call to repent is a, an effective call, verses 10 and 11. Again, familiar scripture, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful and theologically profound. As the rain comes down and, I'm sorry, I skipped a word, and this is an important word in verse 10. For... 
as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither but watereth the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall, empty in other words, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You, you know, I'm convinced the Bible teaches that impenitent people can't repent. It's impossible for them to repent, except for the grace of God. There's nothing in us, nothing in us, before we're converted, that inclines to God and his purity and beauty and holiness. We cannot lift ourselves by our own spiritual bootstraps. We can only repent if God grants us repentance. And the thing is, those to whom God grants this repentance are repenting ones. He grants this saving grace of repentance to those he intends to save. And this is behind the statement of, of 10 and 11 that compares the, the, the rain and snow coming down from the clouds, falling upon the earth, dampening the ground, fostering fertility and life in the plants and fruitfulness, and then evaporating, going back up to the skies, having accomplished what God intends rain and snow to do. There's that, that physical hydrological cycle in nature that is compared to God's word coming down from heaven and accomplishing the spiritual quickening that God intends it to accomplish. And his word doesn't return back to him without having accomplished what God sends it to do any more than the rain and snow evaporates unfruitfully. Now, why is this important at this point in the text? Well, it is because it is a powerful incentive for those hearing the call to repent actually to repent. Because God's word is a powerful word, an effective word that accomplishes spiritual vitality in sinners. Let me, let me give you an illustration from Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 33 and 4. There was a man named Aeneas, we read about in this passage. And it came to pass, this is Acts 9, 32. It came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. Okay, so this is a man who could not walk. He was lame. He was bedridden. It was, it was impossible for him to walk because of his condition. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Arise and make your bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. What's going on here? Well, with the call to get up and make his bed came divine power enabling him to get up and make his bed. And apparently Aeneas believed because when Peter told him to arise and make his bed, which was impossible for him, he had a warrant from the apostolic command to get up and make his bed. And so believing, he got up and made his bed. This is exactly what happens spiritually in God's elect 
eventually when they hear the call to repentance. With the outward call of the gospel, God accompanies, in the case of the elect, the inward call of the Spirit that grants repentance, and they are doing the impossible for them without the Spirit. They are repenting, and they are enjoying the promise of abundant pardon. If you're still impenitent today, the only reason you remain impenitent is your unbelief toward God. If you had faith, you would be repenting, God helping you. And, and actually, you know, when God sends his word with the purpose of saving a particular individual, you know what happens? That individual is saved because God's word will not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which he sends it out. The measure of spiritual fruit in gospel preaching is not limited by the power of this word. It's rather only limited by the extent of God's saving purpose. As I preach tonight, I, I'm not counting on my eloquence or uh, exactly if I say everything just right. I'm counting on the Holy Spirit to do what he is pleased to do and is able to do through a poor instrument like me to poor sinners like you. And I, I can tell you with all confidence, I know that if there's one of God's elect not yet converted in this congregation here tonight that God intends to save in and through my preaching, it shall be done. It shall be done. It doesn't depend on me. It depends on the Spirit of God. Isn't that right? And, and because God's Word is potent like that to do all that He purposes it to do, a blessed future is for sure for the people of God. A blessed new creation with multitudes like the sand of the seashore and like the stars of the sky will certainly become an eschatological reality because of the potency of God's saving word. And that future blessedness and salvation and glory is announced in verses 12 and 13, the last two of the text. This call to repent is a blessed call. That is, it definitely is the prelude to eternal blessedness for God's chosen people. Look at verse 12. It doesn't say, for ye might go out with joy, does it? It announces a future reality. You shall go out with joy and shall be led forth with peace and so forth. The, this is the picturesque imagery in these last two verses of paradise restored. And, and actually the, the rede redemption reality that is foretold in these verses is, to quote my friend Dr. Rich Barcelos, better than the beginning, better than the Garden of Eden. You see how elegant and beautiful the, the language is in verse 12. The mountains and hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. What? Can you imagine singing mountains and clapping trees? We do not interpret such a passage in a crassly literal way. This is a very common literary device in the scriptures, especially the Hebrew Old Testament, that conveys the, the arrival of redemptive blessings in terms of the curse removed from the elements and the blessings that will be enjoyed for God's people. This picturesque imagery of 
paradise restored stands for the substantial reality of spiritual blessing. And, and that is made plain in the text when it says, verse 12, ye shall go out with joy. That's not figurative. That's the experience of emotional joy in your soul. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. This is the repentant ones, the repentant ones who are pardoned of the Lord. They're the ones who are told that they will have this joy and peace. The modern Jewish translation of the Old Testament puts it this way here in the text. You shall leave in joy and be led home secure. And this is in the context historically the Babylonian exile, I believe. So, so the fuller idea is this, spoken to the Jews in that context, you shall leave your exile from God in the heathen land and you will return to your homeland and there you will be joyful and secure. But it's not referring in its fulfillment to some future millennium for Jewish people after Jesus returns. It's describing the salvation blessings that begin for Christians in this life and are consummated in connection with Christ's second coming. And all of this will be fulfilled for the glory of God. Look at verse 13. It shall be to the Lord for a name, that is a reputation. It will be for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. In other words, the sovereign God of grace is determined to make this salvation for all God's people an eternal reality that he might be praised forever and ever and ever for his wisdom and power and strength and mercy and grace. And yes, we who believe and repent have the benefits of salvation, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is creation recovered as an instrument to reflect the glory of the Creator and the Redeemer, particularly Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, in New Testament language, these, these eschatological blessings begin to be experienced by Christians now. And uh, Ephesians 1.3 says to the, the Christians still living on earth that uh, all spiritual blessings are ours in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And all spiritual blessings in Christ are held forth to the wicked and the unrighteous if you will repent. All spiritual blessings in Christ will be yours as a gift today. And you will know you have those blessings as a repenting one on the basis of God's promise. You see? God will forgive you. As incredible as that seems. John Milton, the epic poet, said repentance is the golden key that opens the palace of eternity. Behold, the Apostle Paul wrote, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Beloved, now, right now, the Lord is near and the Lord may be found. Carpe diem, seize the day. Don't procrastinate. Bow your soul before God and pray. The Lord will give you grace to repent and to know the joyful sound that your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. I urge you, I urge you to repent and be saved. Amen.
Shall I offer the closing prayer? All right. Dear ones, let's pray. Oh Lord, how refreshing it has been to our souls to hear your own testimony to your welcoming, gracious favor that uh, you are not a God who delights in punishing the wicked, but in calling us to return to you in faith and repentance and to know the promise of eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. And Lord, it is, I believe, because of a general faith throughout this congregation that we have known the privilege and the patience of, of an extended sermon in the morning and in the evening and evident interest in the things of God. And for that we praise you, but we tremble. We tremble in our hearts, O oh Lord, for the exceptional people here who lack faith and who so far will not repent and Let them know the house is on fire. Let them know that they needn't perish if they will bolt out the door and return to you, they will be saved. Lord, cause them to bolt, to fear, to flee, to believe, to repent, and to give them that peace that surpasses all human understanding. And now, Lord, in the days between this Sabbath and the next, let us be bold in Jesus to open our mouths for him to unbelievers outside the church. Let us be informed about the truth as it is in Jesus, particularly saving gospel truth and bless our informal ministry of a Christian witness to others in our family, among our friends and coworkers, and uh, Lord, preserve us should Jesus coming delay until next Lord's Day when we may gather for worship here again. In Christ's name, amen.